Really just glad to be here. I'm happy to be here too. Uh, last week I was sick. So Friday I came down um, with a, uh, a deadly disease and couldn't get out of bed till something like Monday. Um, and really didn't even feel good until Thursday. So um, that, was, that was quite a week. And so I, I um, had to speak in seminary chapel, the, the chapel uh, at seminary where I went here locally, um, Virginia Beach Theological Seminary. And so I spoke in chapel there Thursday and then also had to prepare for tonight's partners fellowship and thought, I don't know if I can do a third message. I don't actually know if I can. So I've tweaked the message that we did with, uh, that, I, that I did for um, seminary students and professors and other pastors in the area because it was primarily targeted towards uh, leadership and ministry. And I think I want to talk about leadership and ministry, but just about work and life and include all of that in today's message. What that also means is that although we're working our way through the book of James, I'm not actually going to be in James. I'm going to be in Exodus 18. So if you would open your Bibles to Exodus 18, I'd like for you to be there with your Bibles open. We're going to study a little bit from Exodus 18. Actually, everything is from Exodus 18, but we'll also look a little bit at Exodus um, 17 as well and, and then just kind of break into it that way. So again, <clears throat> today, uh, just another caveat, I guess, of sorts is that although I'm going to use terms like leadership or life and work and ministry, I think I would like for us to use that term uh, in a generic or general sense such that all of us understand that in some way or another we are leading. <clears throat> Excuse me. And by leading, I mean serving others around us, others that are in our sphere of influence or sphere of relationships, serving them in such a way that they flourish. They come to a sense of their own calling and identity, and they flourish in what God has called them to do. That would be my idea of what leadership is. Um, so if you consider yourself to be a leader in the home or a leader in the workplace or a leader in the church or a leader in your neighborhood, then what I'm imagining is that it's your primary responsibility as a leader to serve those around you so that they flourish and so that the people and the systems and structures you put into place flourish um, for God's glory and for the good of, of those um, in our care. So that's kind of how I understand leadership. And since I'm saying it that way, I don't really want us to think of ministry as full-time ministry. It's kind of both and. Like, is ministry full-time occupational ministry or is ministry something that every believer is called to do? And I would say it's both. There's a sense in which what I do is work for the church, work for our, our church as an organization and as a community, <clears throat> as a full-time minister of the gospel. But I don't want us to always see it that way in terms of what ministry is. I want for the purposes of today and really just for the purposes of our lives, each of us, to understand that we are all called by God in some way, in some capacity to serve him, to ser serve others. And this, in my estimation, would be ministry. It's just as much ministry what you're doing in a cubicle working with spreadsheets and bringing flourishing to the work God's called you to do and to the environment God's called you to be in and to the people God's called you to work with. As, as much ministry, that, that is, as me doing what I'm doing right now on a stage in front of a church, something like that. I, I don't want us to see ministry as something other than spiritual, or I mean something only spiritual but that ministry really is just whatever God's calling us to do, wherever he's calling us to do that. And so it's a both and for me. So that's why I think today, even though I, I was talking to pastors and people who want to be pastors on Thursday, today I'm talking to all of us as ministers in general and as leaders in some way, whether it's in the home or the neighborhood or the church or the places of work or the places of recreation that all of us are a part of. Okay, so that good? Is that enough caveats? Can we get into the word together? <clears throat> Exodus chapter 18, it says here in Exodus 18, there, I don't want to read the first 12 verses just for the sake of time. I want to get to verse 13, but as an overview sort of of the whole passage in chapter 18 of Exodus, Moses is encouraged by his father-in-law Jethro um, to set up a system or structure of handling judicial cases so that, so that most of them aren't handled by Moses alone, but so that he actually is able to delegate and, and disperse the, the workload amongst other leaders in Israel, trustworthy uh, men, and, and so that only the most notable or only the most difficult cases would be escalated to Moses. And certainly I think this would come in handy. It, chapter 18 of Exodus comes just before chapter 19. Okay comes just before chapter 19, and in chapter 19, we get the setup for the law, the Mosaic Covenant or the law, the Ten Commandments. 
Um, the Ten Commandments come starting in 19, and then we see the outlining of them in chapter 20. But chapter 19 is where we begin to see the Ten Commandments. And so in chapter 18, this is where Jethro, and I'd never really connected these dots, but this is where God sends Jethro to Moses and helps Moses establish a structure of sorts for governing the nation under what will be coming, which is the law. And so it's just brilliant to see the timing of God and how he works all of this out. There's a few things here in chapter 18 that I think are interesting that, that um, Moses is encouraged by his father-in-law, Jethro. Now, the, the word father-in-law is used 13 times in this chapter. And I guess to indicate that not all father-in-laws are evil. I, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> I don't actually know. And so maybe if there's a scholar here or someone just fascinated by word studies, maybe you can help me uh, understand why it uses father-in-law so much. But I actually do think it's because it indicates uh, the level of intimacy and familiarity that Jethro had with him. It was someone that knew Moses fairly well. Uh, they'd spent at least 40 years together after Moses was 40 years old and fled Egypt um, to spend 40 years alone there with Jethro and his family and married one of Jethro's daughters. So I think he knew Moses pretty well. And so I think the indication here is that his father-in-law was able to say some things that maybe no one else could say. And you'll see that here in just a little bit. <clears throat> I think um, there's a few other points that are interesting about Jethro and Moses' encounter um, and that may be of note to you, um, but wouldn't, wouldn't be sort of a stream that we're going to study today. But this encounter of Jethro with Moses has um, at least five parallels with the encounter of Melchizedek and Abraham. So this would be um, very interesting, I think, to flesh out. And just before the Abrahamic covenant, God sends uh, Mo, uh, Abraham to meet with Melchizedek or Melchizedek to come out and meet with Abraham. And just before we get this Mosaic covenant, God sends Jethro to meet with Moses and to give him some instruction. And it's just really fascinating to see that. So there's a few parallels there, but not really what we're going to get into for the sake of his message. But I, I say that just to maybe pique your interest. Study the Word of God. There's so many interesting connections there um, that even I, you know, I, I or anyone would be able to make without doing a little bit of study and, and thinking. So, well, today I want to talk a little bit about our calling and a little bit about what God was calling Moses to do so that we can use some parallels for our own lives um, as we think about what God is calling us to do, individuals and even as a church. All right, so I'm going to read the chapter. Uh, I'm going to read uh, from verse 13 to 23, and I'm just going to do a running commentary. So if you're the kind of person that likes three points and then maybe a poem to wrap it up or some illustration to wrap it up, um, it's not going to happen today. And actually, I'm just not even good at that. It rarely happens. So when I preach, it's more like I'm crafting a story and I just meander through the text. So sorry, guys, I'm realizing that about myself and realizing that most of you have to put up with that. So... Uh, fortunately, they're on our teaching team. We have a guy like Dan who is just so clear and such a good teacher that he'll give three points and even three points of application, and it's just so clear. So thank you, Dan. Where are you, Dan? Thank you for preaching uh, and, and really filling in for me last week with such an excellent message on such a short notice. Well, let's meander. Let's get into the verse and uh, into the passage and let's study. Verse 13 of chapter 18 in Exodus, it says, The next day... The next day Moses took his seat to hear the people's disputes against each other. And they waited for him, or they waited before him, but either, either way, they waited for him bef uh, from morning until evening. From morning till evening. There's a couple of things we're just going to stop and do some running commentary. There, this phrase at the very beginning of verse 13, the next day, is fascinating to me. Moses has not seen his family for at least three months, maybe 10 months is what most commentaries would say. He's left his family there in Midian. They, they were supposed to have come with him, and it's not clear if they left at some point along the way to Egypt or after um, they, uh, the, the Israelites left Egypt, his family, he sent his family off. It's not clear at what point, but somewhere between three to 10 months, Moses has not seen his family. And I'm gonna go with 10 months. The better part of a year, and Jethro shows up with his family. They greet one another. They hug one another. They give thanks to God. And they celebrate all that God has done in delivering Israel from uh, the Egyptians. And, and instead of taking a few days to spend with his family after being reunited after almost a, a year, it says the next day Moses took his seat to hear the people's disputes against each other. And they waited before him from morning till evening. Essentially, what I guess I'm getting at is that Moses is working too hard. 
there's just no break when his family gets there. And, it, and again, it's been 10 months. And so I don't think Moses is taking very good care of himself. And, and fortunately, this is just two months into the 40-year journey they're about to take in the wilderness. Do you know that they spent 40 years traveling the wilderness? We are only two months into this 40-year journey, and Moses is already wearing himself out. And so it's a good thing here, I think, that Jethro comes at such a timely time and says to him uh, some of the things that he says. Because the very next day, with no break, Moses goes right back to work, and he works morning till evening. And as far as I can see, Moses doesn't seem to be taking care of himself. He's too busy taking care of others. You know, this plays out in my life, and, and maybe you can sort of imagine how it plays out in your life. But a lot of times as I think about teaching the scriptures most weeks, I don't preach all the time, and I'm happy for that, grateful for that. But I do actually make, uh, make it my profession. It is part of what I do for a living to teach God's word. And it's all I ever want to do. It's all I want to do uh, with the rest of my life in whatever capacity, in whatever way, but to teach God's word. Um, it's all I've dreamed of doing since I was in kindergarten. And so I love teaching God's word. But for me what happens sometimes is it's, I imagine it's like a chef who can craft tasty meals. And he doesn't have to be the best chef, okay? But a chef who can craft tasty enough meals that, that a few people like them and, and uh, ends up dying of starvation because he's never really ever feasting on those same meals or any other meals. Can you imagine how ironic that would be? And in my own life, I have to be careful. And, and I confess that at times I'm not great at, at studying God's word and digesting God's word for myself. There'll be times where God will show me something and I'll think, ooh, that'll be good for a sermon someday. And I can almost feel the presence of the Lord. You know, I can almost feel God say, that was for you, buddy. You need to feast on that for you. And so I think for me, um, as, I, as I think about this, it's kind of like Moses working so hard and he's not taking care of time to really feast on, on the Lord, feast on time with the Lord and really take the breaks he needs. And so Jethro comes at just a timely uh, place in his life. Too busy taking care of others. One of my mentors said, what good is a bleeding heart if it bleeds to death? What good is it if you, if you do everything you do without taking some time to really restore and refresh your soul in God's presence, in God's word, with God's people, under the influence of God's spirit? As I think about it in my own life and in all of our lives, this is instructional for us, a sign of imbalance in maybe life and work or a sign of imbalance in, in life, work, ministry, leadership, whatever God's calling us to do is not just, uh, for me, it would be lack of, of attention to personal health. And that would be spiritual, mental, emotional, um, sexual, financial, relational, uh, I'm, you know, any of, of those categories. And I'm sure if we, if we did something on a whiteboard, you could help me think of maybe five or six other categories. But I'm thinking of holistic health for us, and a sign of imbalance here is when we're not paying attention to our own personal health and when we're not really paying attention to our own family, his or her family. And I think that's critical for us to see, that, that poor stewardship of, of personal health and, and our leadership as we see it here in this verse with Moses, we see that it not only affects the leader, like as in your ability to lead and my ability to lead or to serve and to care for others, it affects, directly affects those whom we lead. And that's exactly what Jethro tells Moses. <clears throat> so we're going to get to that. It says, the next day Moses took his seat to hear the people's disputes against each other. They waited before him from morning till evening, and he was there to hear the people's disputes against each other. Uh, that's still verse 13. And I think for us, what we see here in terms of the disputes that people have with each other is that this is in contrast with a verse later in the, in the chapter where these people are not experiencing peace. Later, Jethro puts some things into place for Moses and then says, and now if you do these things, the people will go home in peace. Well, what we're seeing at the beginning here, and I guess at the beginning of this section, is that actually these people are not experiencing peace. They are disputing against one another. And, and do you remember how long they've been on this journey? Well, let's start with this. How long will they be on this journey in the wilderness? 40 years, great. And we are just two months in, and Moses is morning till night trying to resolve their disputes against one, one another. This is a crazy bunch. This is a, a, a demanding kind of people. And can you imagine how exhausting this must have been? 
Now, if I asked you about whatever realm or domain of service and leadership you're involved in, whether that's your home or the actual place you work or, or say, like outside of the home or if that's your uh, responsibilities in some other arena of your life, um, could you not also say with me and, and maybe even with Moses that it's exhausting at times? It really can be exhausting. Moses is experiencing that, but I think the people are starting to experience that. And in chapter 17, I think it's, to me it's humorous, but it's not humorous at all. The chapter just before that in chapter 17, the first half of the chapter is actually a conversation that Moses is having with the people, and they are murmuring, they are complaining, and they're saying things like, have you brought us out here to die in the wilderness? Did we leave Egypt and all the good things we had there? Which time out, was anything good there? We, we just are such a forgetful people. So they say, did you take us from Egypt where we had everything we needed out here to die in the wilderness? Is that what you've done? And so Moses comes to God, and there, there's this complaining bunch, all the people's disputes. He comes to God, and he says, these people are ready to stone me. You have to help me. You can just see him sort of at his wit's end just two months in. And for me, it just absolutely cracks me up feels a little bit like church planting um, in terms of just the overwhelming demand at times that that can happen, especially early on when you're trying to get something up and off the ground. I can remember um, those days and even at times feel overwhelmed like that. But if you think about it, no wonder he feels like everybody's trying to stone him. If he's resolving everyone's disputes, which we're going to see, Moses is the only one doing this, And these are the kind of disputes that you can't resolve over the dinner table at night with you and your buddy or your neighbor. But they have to get escalated to go stand in line all day to talk to Moses. Then there's such a sharp disagreement there that when Moses gives his final answer and sort of weighs the matter and then gives his answer to them, how many percent of the people are leaving happy and how many percent are leaving upset about it? 50%. You can get better odds than most Baptist or Presbyterian churches. This is bad. He feels like 50% of the people want to stone him. And he's just doing too much, guys. The point I'm trying to make is that basically if leaders aren't healthy, it affects the ones that they lead. Uh, And you can see that in other areas. Just as an example, if parents aren't healthy, it affects the family. It affects the children. If one of the partners in a relationship is not healthy, it affects the relationship. This is part of what, I'm, what I try to, Joanne and I talk through uh, with couples, is that there's really no such thing as a good marriage and a bad marriage. There's only healthy people and unhealthy people. And so I think that's the same idea here. If we're not healthy, it begins really to have a widespread effect. Verse 14, when Moses' father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he asked, what are you really accomplishing here? Why are you trying to do this all alone while everyone stands around you from morning till evening? What what Jethro is saying here is what are you actually doing for these people? As in, how is what you're doing helping them? What, What exactly are you hoping to accomplish by this? And here's something I think is very practical for any of us as we think about what God's calling us to do. It's a crucial step in any leadership role or any leadership endeavor, just any endeavor God's calling you to do, is to take a minute and answer the question that Jethro is asking Moses, which is, help me understand and clarify for yourself what is your purpose and direction. It's a vision statement of sorts. What is the vision for Anchor Church? What is the vision for for what you're doing? And by vision, I I don't really like that word. It's sort of a a word that a lot of um, uh, maybe maybe church structure and church governance or even just church marketing might use, like the vision of the church. Uh, For me, it just feels like uh, a bit nebulous. But when I think about vision, I think about purpose and direction. And I think that's not just organizationally. We're going to talk a little bit about that tonight at our Partners Fellowship, a little bit about the purpose of Anchor Church, and then a little bit about our strategy for discipleship. We'll talk about that tonight at our Partners Fellowship. So I think for you, though, it's not just organizationally, but even in your own life, have you ever stopped to just imagine what the purpose is for why God has you on the planet? I think there are, there are very natural purposes that God has us. And it comes in cycles and it also comes in seasons. And so right now I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, my primary purpose is to, uh, is to worship the Lord, to be in relationship with him and to steward that relationship 
to care for my wife and to love her and serve her and to care for, protect, provide for my children that God's given me and also to work hard um, for the glory of God and for the good of our church because that's what I do for a living. In other words, there are seasons and times and there are certain things that just make sense. I know I'm supposed to do that, but all of us have jobs like that. All of us have responsibilities like that. And I think it's good for us at times to take stock in where we're at, what God is doing in our lives, and then what God might be calling us to do. The reason for that is because sometimes I think some of us may be doing less than God has called us to do, and other times I think maybe more likely in the church, some of us are doing way more than God is calling us to do. And I think it's good to take some time here and actually evaluate, okay, of all the things we've got going, and of all the things that everyone else in my family has going, and of all the other things and categories, how much of this is God actually calling me to do, and why are we doing some of the things that we're doing? And then just evaluating this. This sounds like a pragmatic, practical message, but guys, this comes from Exodus 18, and it's good advice for Moses from Jethro. It's good advice for us to listen to. If we want to glorify God and make much of him in what he's called us to do, we've got to first identify what he's called us to do and do nothing less and nothing more. Just do what he's calling us to do. If all of us were being led, filled by the Spirit, led by the Spirit to do what God was calling us to do, we could turn Hampton Roads upside down in just three years. There's, there's just, that's all there is to it. And as I think about this, it's a crucial step to take some time to think about that and identify this. But I want to take it further because Jethro takes it further. Moses replies, because the people came to me to get a ruling from God, this is how he's identifying what he's called to do. He says, when a dispute arises, they come to me, and I'm the one who settles the case between the quarreling parties. I inform the people of God's decrees and give them his instructions. What happens here is is a bit twofold. One is that Moses takes some time to clarify his role, but then on the other hand, Jethro, just the next verse, Jethro says to him, this is not good. In other words, thank you for clarifying what you're doing, but but there's something about what you're saying that, that alarms, something about what Moses is saying that alarms Jethro, and it's that Moses has taken too much upon himself. Once again, Uh, He may have the domain right, like I'm called to serve my family in the home, but maybe I've taken too much upon myself, too much of the sense of responsibility that I should share with the Lord to do his part in the lives of, say, my children. This is especially hard for, I think, um, for those of us who might have grown children, for us to take a step back and actually realize that although, yes, it is within my domain, like Moses said, it's my domain to teach them the law and to judge them and to, to do all that God's called me to do. Yes, you're right, Moses, but you're doing it all by yourself and you're taking way too much of that responsibility on you. In other words, the Lord can do some of this too, right? We've got to release those things that God's not calling us to do, those things that we are not directly responsible for, to the Lord at times and ask him to, to, to work those things out. And this, I think, is what Moses is struggling with. This is a side note and a separate study. But if you look at the life of Moses, I don't consider myself to be a Moses of sorts, not by any stretch. But I, I do actually see that at times I struggle with what Moses struggled with here, taking too much upon myself, taking too much responsibility for the things that are not within my realm of, uh, or my responsibility. And you see it here just two months into the journey of the wilderness. You also see it in Numbers chapter 11 where Moses once again has taken too much upon himself. And then you see it again at the very end of Moses' life where he strikes the rock at the second time when God said, speak to it. And this actually prevents him from going into the promised land. He's actually, I don't know if you call it punished, but one of the consequences for taking too much upon himself um, is I think that he not only gets burned out, but that he actually misses out on the opportunity to lead. This is happening with a lot of celebrity pastors in our culture. Now, I speak about celebrity pastors. It's happening probably with CEOs and whoever else runs businesses or whatever other industry you can imagine. But just being a pastor, thinking through this, what's happening a lot of times is um, I can see, as even the church grows, how easy it would be to take too much upon, say, myself or too much upon ourselves. And what's happening... uh, I think is that they're getting removed from leadership for the same reason that Moses gets removed from leadership. Just you're, you're, you're burning yourself out. Doing too much for too many people that's not within your realm or your responsibility or within your calling. 
So I think it's happened to me. It's could happen to any of us wherever we're at. And I think it's good that Jethro comes to him at a time like this. Jethro listens to what Moses says. And look at verse 17. In verse 17, uh, it says, This is not good, Moses' father-in-law exclaimed. Verse 18, he says, You're going to wear yourself out and the people too. You're going to get worn out and you're going to wear everyone else out. What I love about what Jethro says is, is when he says that this is not good, for me, I hear an echo. I don't know if you hear the echoes of Exodus 2.18 where God looks at Adam and says, this is not good. He, he makes the earth, the, the earth and the sky and the heavens and the stars and the sun and the plants and the animals and, and even Adam. And everything is good, and it was good, and it was very good, and it was good. God says everything's good, and then the one thing he notices that is not good is that Adam is alone. <clears throat> I think this is uh, maybe an echo, but, but who knows. Uh, Moses did write um, Genesis, so maybe there's some stream here. But I think what I want to get at is that Jethro notices that Moses is handling too much alone. Not only that, but I think when, when um, Jethro tells Moses, this is not good, you're going to wear yourself out and wear the people out. I don't think Jethro is saying, what you're doing is not a noble task. It's not a good task. You're not doing good things. You're, you know, you're selling drugs, Moses. He, he's not saying something like that. Like, you're doing a really bad thing here. He's saying to, to Moses, that's really good, what you're, what you're saying is you're calling, but it's not good how you're doing it. So it wasn't just the what you're doing, but how you're going about this wasn't good. And I think this speaks to the second part of maybe some leadership principles if you were to do a study on Exodus 18 and leadership. The second point is that once you've clarified your vision or your purpose and direction and have a clear sense of calling, which we're going to talk about at the end of this message if I can hurry up and get there, I think secondly you have to clarify strategy. So now I've got purpose and I need to take a step back and think through strategy. And, and I think that's, <clears throat> for us, again, another point we'll talk about tonight at our Partners Fellowship, to just clarify that the purpose of Anchor Church is to help people find hope in Jesus. But if it's just something we're doing, you know, by faith, I don't think we're good enough stewards of what God might be calling us to do in Hampton Roads if we don't go further than that to, to actually identify how we're going to make disciples and how we're going to plant churches, how we're actually going to help people find hope in Jesus. So I think that's the second leadership strategy here. And the reason I'm pointing these out is not because I think they're the main thrust of this message, um, <clears throat> but I think it's valuable to point this out so that at least you've got some biblical precedent for answering questions like, what is my purpose? And what is my calling? And you've even got biblical pre precedence for being a steward of that call and a steward of God's purpose for your life by sitting down and taking some time to write out strategy, to write out a plan for how you think God might be calling you to do this. This is good for us to do. And, and I, I say that because I think sometimes what I'm talking about right now, uh, I can picture myself in seminary studying the word or something, and I can picture other seminarians around me, uh, other sort of people who just love God and are filled with faith saying, ah, that's just too man-centered, it's too pragmatic, you don't need all that stuff. You just, need to, you just need to know what God's calling you to do, and then just by faith it's all gonna come together and it's gonna happen. In, in some ways, yes, and, and also in some ways, no. And so I want to encourage us to be stewards of our lives, be stewards of what God's calling us to do. If we don't, verse 18 will happen. Let's go back to verse 18. You're going to wear yourself out and the people too. This job is too heavy a burden for you to handle all by yourself. We can have a clear sense of our calling, but if we're not wise or skilled stewards of what God's entrusted to us, we end up wearing ourselves out and wearing our people out. Now, I think for us, it's clear that God wants to use us. God wants to use you. He wants to use me. He wants to use us in the lives of the people around us, wherever we go. But we don't have to have the most flashy abilities to make the most of what God has entrusted to us by way of serving other people. We don't have to have all the flashy abilities or all the, the most talented skills um, to be able to use what God's given us for his glory uh, in our life and in our ministry. You can start today doing just what God called you to do, and you and I can stop wearing ourselves out doing things we're not called to do or trying to do things we're not gifted to do. And this for me is a critical difference between Moses in Exodus chapter 17 and then Moses in Exodus chapter 18. 
Here in Moses 18, excuse me, Moses 18. Here in Exodus 18, Moses is actually being told by Jethro, I think by way of the Lord, uh, Moses ends up putting all this into practice. Moses is being told by Jethro, hey, you're doing more than what God's called you to do. And you're gonna need to help others do what God's calling them to do. But when you look at Exodus 17, it's a little bit different than that. Will you read Exodus 17 with me? There's uh, Exodus 17, and I want you to just read verses 10 to 13 with me. So Joshua did what Moses commanded and fought the army of Amalek. And now these are the, the Amalekites, and this is the nation of Amalek, and they are in a battle with the children of Israel. All right? And so Joshua goes out, and he's the commander of the army, and he goes out and he fights. Meanwhile, Moses and Aaron and Hur climbed to the top of a nearby hill. As long as Moses held up the staff in his hand, the Israelites had the advantage. But whenever he dropped his hand, the Amalekites gained the advantage. Moses' arms soon became so tired he could no longer hold them up. So Aaron and Hur found a stone for him to sit on, and then they stood on each side of Moses, holding up his hands so that his hands held steady until the sunset. And as a result, Joshua overwhelmed the army of, of Amalek in battle. The only reason I want us to read just that section is because I think for some of us, we're going to need to learn the difference between Exodus 17 and Exodus 18. The difference between where you need help with what God's called you to do and, and where you need to help others do what God's calling them to do. And as we study this, I think Moses needed to learn that difference. It's not more than what God's calling us to do, not less than what God's calling us to do, but just what God's calling us to do. And I think that boredom happens when we're doing less than what God calls us to do. And I think burnout happens when we're doing more than what God calls us to do. You know, these weird sins that people in leadership end up committing, they might just be doing less than what God called them to do. When, we get when we're doing less than that, when we're not giving the full stewardship of all of our energy and resources to do what God calls us to do, I think we end up with a kind of boredom that really uh, is a resultant sort of frustration in our life um, with, with the way things are turning out in our life. Have you ever felt that? I've felt that at times. Just a, a sense of frustration that things just don't go the way I want and I don't even really know what I'm doing or why I'm doing it. This happens at times and seasons of all of our lives. And you know that might be a sign of just not having good clarity on your purpose and call and then giving all of your steward, uh, stewarding all of your resources, your time, energy, and whatever uh, margin you've got financially to do what God has called you to do, nothing more, nothing less. When we're doing less, it results in frustration. It results in sin, a kind of sort of playful sin or a kind of sin that satisfies the need to fill the time or even to fill the emptiness in our soul because we're doing less than what God's called us to do, less than what he, what he has purposed for us. And then I think burnout is, is probably just a symptom of doing more than what he's called us to do. I've realized that in church planting, uh, which, you know, we're going to be seven years old in September, it's possible in those early stages of church planting for all of us, not just me, all of us, uh, many of us who are partners, longtime partners, to just, um, to just do everything. We, everything has to get done. Um, but I think it's also been good for me to see and over the years try to put into practice that we can share the load by creating a healthy culture of, of, uh, of hospitality, a healthy culture of leadership in the church, and even just embracing one another and serving together as a family. So seeing this less as an organization with things to get done and a family with people to care for. And that has helped us, I think, in the long run. But in a church plant setting or in a sort of new environment or a new ministry, it is possible to overwhelm yourself by taking too much upon yourself. This happens in a new family dynamic, doesn't it? You go from single to married, you're overwhelmed. Well, maybe I was, or maybe I overwhelmed Joanne. I'm sorry, babe. <clears throat> and you go into some new endeavor and you have your first child or something, imagining that, you know, and it's just overwhelming. Or you get a new job and you go into it. It's possible because you want to please those people or because you have sort of a, an angst or a fear or something to just work yourself up and wear yourself out. 
And so I think we need to just take some time alone with the Lord to really discern how he's calling us and what he's calling us to do. And then I think there's a couple of other things. We're going to talk some more about this. The job, as Jethro tells Moses, is too hard to handle by yourself. It's too heavy for you. And I want you to see Paul. I envision Paul, uh, and I can hear his words um, as, he, as he says it in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Paul says, who is sufficient for these things? Who is able to do all that God is doing? In other words, I can't do all that I'm seeing, all that God is doing. He's sort of at the beginnings of the church and its expansion and saying that there's no way I can do this. But I want you to see the context of that verse. In 2 Corinthians 2 12 to 13, it says, When I came to the city of Troas, this is Paul, I came to the city of Troas to preach the good news of Christ. Now he knows that God has called him to do that. The Lord opened a door of opportunity for me. When, when you have a purpose and then God opens the door for you to fulfill that purpose, what do you do? You do it. But I want you to see something fascinating in verse 13. But I had no peace of mind because my dear brother Titus turned his cell phone off, and I couldn't reach him. Can you imagine how stressful, even 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 2,000 years ago, how stressful it would have been to be like, where is Titus? If I showed up in Hampton Roads, I'd be like, okay, some tall buildings in town center. I'll start there. Where would you even find somebody? It's so stressful for me to think about it. I'm starting to get anxiety now even just talking about it. How would I find my kids? How would I find my wife? You know, oh, it's it's crazy to think what life was like before we had cell phones. Okay, but he he says here, but I had no peace of mind because my dear brother Titus hadn't arrived yet with a report from you. So instead of moving forward with the open door of opportunity, I said goodbye. And I went and found, I went on to Macedonia to find him. The point I'm trying to make here is that Paul refuses to do ministry or to fulfill his calling alone. He refuses to do it alone. It's never good for anyone to be alone. And isolation, this is something else a mentor of mine shared with me, that isolation, it's not the worst thing we do, it's the way we do the worst things. And Paul refuses to do it. That's not just, uh, it's, it's never good for man to be alone. And that's not just sort of marriage advice. That's actually leadership advice. That's lifelong advice for anyone who wants to be a servant of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what we are, a partnership in the gospel. This is not, you know, the, the way I grew up understanding church was that um, if you wanted folks to get saved or to become a Christian, then just every, the, your responsibility in the pews was to get other people to come to the pews. And then the person on the stage, it was his responsibility to share the good news and to lead them to Christ. So I'm wanting to change that paradigm a little bit and understand that actually all of us as partners in the gospel are called in a partnership together, working together so that each of us and wherever God is calling us to do is actually partnering in the gospel to share the gospel and to share our lives with people wherever God's calling us to do that. This is why we call it partnership and not really just membership. This is a partnership in the gospel. That's my hope and prayer for Anchor Church, that we would be a partnership in the gospel. It's not a partnership in our preferences. Like, well, I kind of prefer because they meet at the Sandler Center. Or I kind of prefer that style of teaching. Or I kind of prefer that kind of music. And if that ever changes, well, I'm going to go to another place where I prefer. That's not, and it's okay if you prefer Anchor Church or something like that. I'm just saying that that's not the, the, at the top of the rubric for how you make a decision on, on where, what kind of community you're going to join yourself to. I think for us, If we want to be a part of Anchor Church and you're thinking about it, I want to partner together to care for each other, to make sure we look out for each other and love one another. And so that you have the trust in me and I have the trust in you that wherever I'm at, I'm a partner with you in the gospel, sharing the good news. And wherever you're at, you're a partner in the gospel, sharing the good news wherever you go. And where we get opportunity, we're going to try to do it together as a community to share and show the gospel to people in our community as a a whole, as a collective unit. Do you see that? That's a partnership. That's a church. That's my prayer for us. And, and I think this is part of a takeaway for me as I'm studying what Jethro tells Moses. You're trying to do this all alone. And maybe that's some of our issue. We're trying to raise kids all alone. We're trying to fix our marriage all alone. We're trying to find a spouse all alone. We're trying to look for a job all alone. We're trying to identify calling all alone. We're trying to do everything we're doing all alone. 
I didn't want to be a part of starting a church to be alone. And we're inviting you to be a part of our church family, not so you can still be alone, but so that we can be family, so we can be together, so that we can carry one another's burdens, and so that we together can reach Hampton Roads together, not just with each other, but even with the other gospel-preaching churches in Hampton Roads. We're not meant to be alone. Anchor Church is not meant to be alone, and neither are you when we're together as, as Anchor. And the way I see this um, is, is basically like, like if three of us, let's just imagine that whoever's on the front row here, is that you, Cody? Cody? Let's imagine that you and I and Joanne and Jackie and the four of us decided that we were going to go to South America to start a church. Would you find a house on the other side of town where we couldn't even really get together? I don't think so. Would you find a job that kept you from even really partnering with Joanne and I? Would you guys find jobs that kept you guys from really even partnering together in any meaningful way to reach Costa Rica? No. I mean, some of the first things we would do is we'd begin to strategize. Where are we going to live? And let's try to be close to each other. Okay, what jobs are we going to do? And let's find ones that give us some margin if we can. And if there's a season where we don't have margin, that's fine. We'll just work around that. And we'll do something else as a, as a, couple, as a couple of couples. But we're going to work together. And you know what? Let's start thinking now. Who, who can we invite over? Who can you invite over to your home? I'm going to invite some folks over to my home. And how can we begin to build relationships so that at some point you and I are going to meet and we're going to pray together for those couples. But then we're going to try to see if we can't get them all together for some kind of barbecue and just introduce each other to our friends. And then let's slowly over time see if we can share the good news with them. Guys, that's what we ought to be doing right here. We don't need to move halfway around the world to be missionaries, to be thinking like missionaries and living like missionaries, to be energized by the good news of Jesus and to be in a, in a functional partnership with each other, thinking through, okay, how do we pray for each other and how do we pray for the ones that each other is trying to reach and how can we strategize together to think through the best ways to care for them, invite them into our fellowship and even to show them Christ and lead them to Christ through the good news of his gospel. This is the work of what the church is supposed to be doing. And this I'm bringing up because we can't do it alone. Cannot do this alone. I've got to wrap this up. So let me read verse 19 to 22. Jethro says to Moses, now listen to me and let me give you a word of advice. And may God be with you. You should continue to be the people's representative before God. So he gives him some affirmation. You should continue doing that. That's good. Bringing their disputes to God. Good. Verse 20, teach them God's decrees and give them his instructions and show them how to conduct their lives. But here's the change. So he affirms his calling and then he gives him some strategy. But here's what I want you to do, Moses. Select from all the people some capable, honest men who fear God and hate bribes. Appoint them as leaders over groups of 1,000, groups of 100, groups of 50, groups of 10. And they should always be available to solve the people's common disputes, but have them bring the major cases to you. And let the leaders decide the smaller matters themselves, and they will help you carry the load, making the task easier for you. I think there's a, a few things to point out. The first is that Jethro affirms Moses' calling and responsibilities. It's good to get that affirmation instead of doing it alone, as we've mentioned already. I think getting affirmation from godly friends and pastors you trust and even other mentors in your life, this practice um, would prevent probably a lot of the hardship that we go through. Another point here is that Jethro tells Moses what kind of men to look for, what kind of people to, to deploy on this, on this mission. And, and I think it assumes that Moses needs to be one of these kinds of guys too. And when we look at our lives and we look at our responsibilities and we look at the ministry, whatever that is, wherever that is, I think we've got to take some stock in not just what we're learning or what we're doing, but what, who we're becoming in this process. And a lot of times I, I say it this way because life for us in a sort of Western mind and an American mindset is linear, right? We land at Jamestown and we just work our way across from sea to shining, shining sea. And, and that's in our minds. If, if you're struggling with something and then you learn something new that helps you break through, doesn't it feel like good? I'm so glad I realized that. That has really helped me. But have you discovered in six months or within a year or so, you're back struggling with the same thing again? 
That's because I think for us, a lot of times in our minds, it's linear. It's like, okay, I'm going to grow. And each step is growth, and it builds on the other. But, but if I learn what I need to learn, do what I need to do, then hopefully I'll never have to face this again, right? That's why when we get into hardship, we're saying to ourselves, God, just teach me what I need to know so I can get through this and be done with it. It's kind of a linear Western way of thinking. Whereas life really is more circular or cyclical. God's going to teach you the same thing over and over again. He's going to teach it to you in the home, and it's going to rear its head at work, and then it's going to rear its head in the church, and it's going to rear its head in the neighborhood. And you're going to have to deal with the same things over and over and over again. And God's doing something in you with that. Shouldn't be discouraged. Why am I dealing with the same thing? Why am I struggling with the same things? Hey, life isn't linear. You don't just move on from one struggle and then, you know, get six months break until the next struggle that's completely different than the last one. Guys, the way it works is that it's cyclical. And we're going to face these things over and over again. And God's going to work through that and develop us in every area of our lives. And so don't get discouraged. It's hard work, but it's good work. And God's developing virtue. He's developing the kind of character traits that Jethro tells Moses to look for. Virtue is the most prized commodity in leadership material. Even the qualifications for an elder or the qualifications for a deacon in the New Testament, there's very little, if anything, except maybe able to teach. There's very little in those qualifications to meet the, one of the offices of the church. There's very little there that has anything to do with skill or ability or talent or gifting. And everything there, if you go read it for yourself in 1 Timothy 3, has everything to do with character. Character, virtue. That's the most important thing, and that's what Jethro affirms with him. And I guess to wrap this up, because I absolutely have to, we need, <clears throat> we need for us the energy to do this hard work God's calling us to do. Were, were you like me? I think my wife and I at times when, um, oh, I mean, I, every, every, every step of the way, I feel like high school was hard work. Uh, college was hard work. And, and, and then work after college was hard work. Trying to find a job and then trying to get good at that job was hard work. When, when I got married, when we got married, we felt like it was hard work. We felt like maybe we were doing it all wrong at first. It felt really hard. And then when we had our first kid, we were overwhelmed. Neither one of us were sleeping. We weren't, I was mad at the baby, mad at Joanne. She mad at me. And we, we couldn't figure this thing out. It's hard work. We started this church, and nine months in, I was thinking, well, I guess we should close the doors. <laughs> this is hard work. It still feels like hard work. Everything you're doing feels like hard work. There's nothing wrong with that. It's good. It's good to be um, doing the work that God calls us to do, because when we're doing what God calls us to do, there's an endless supply of energy for that. If you're convinced you're supposed to do something, you want to, and you feel like God wants you to do it, I wouldn't have to ask you three times. You just do it. You love doing it. And that's kind of how I want Anchor Church to operate. I know we've got, you know, things to do. We've got child care, and we've got connections team, and we've got all these responsibilities. We're just sharing those things. What I'm talking about is what God's calling us to do outside of these four walls in this community. God's calling you to do something. You can think through how best to get that done. We can think through that together as a partnership. And God will give you the energy you need to do the hard work he's calling you to do. This energy is what he describes in Colossians 1.29. Paul says, that's why I work and struggle so hard. It's depending on Christ's mighty power that works within me. I guess what I'm getting at here is that when we look at Moses' life, wasn't he working so hard? Like maybe working too hard? When we opened this passage, didn't we see him? His family is reunited, and the next day he's back at work. Well, when I, and, and then by the end, and so I'm saying he's working too hard. And then by the end of this message, I'm saying life is hard and, and you need to work hard. And what I guess I want you to see as, as I'm saying that is work hard. <clears throat> on the things that God's called you to do. And I think when work becomes hard, it's because we're doing more or less than God has called us to do. So when, when Paul says, this is why I work and struggle so hard, I'm depending, verse, this is Colossians 1.29, I'm depending on Christ's mighty power. Uh, one of the uh, uh, Bible translations says, I'm depending on Christ's energy that works within me. When, when God calls us and we give ourselves to that calling, God works an energy in us to do what he's calling us to do. 
Now there's more to say about working for a place of rest and working from a place of rest. And what I mean by that is that when we're working so hard to try and get something we want so bad, I think that's different. That's working for a place of rest, working towards something we're hoping to attain as opposed to resting in the Lord, resting in our identity with him, resting in our inheritance with him. We have a future we don't have to work so hard to attain. We already have those things. When we can rest in that, then the hard work he calls us to do will have endless energy for it. Often, hard work is hard because I'm striving for a source of identity in it. Hard work is hard because I'm hoping to gain an inheritance with this. And what I guess I'm saying is there's a difference between trying to attain all that and resting in the fact that you've already obtained all that because of what Christ has done for you. Christ already did the hard and heavy lifting to earn us that identity of belonging to him as his children. He has already done the hard work and heavy lifting to secure for us a rich inheritance that will never fade away. And you don't have to try and get an identity from what you do or what your responsibilities are or from whatever role you're playing. You don't have to, every, every, every sense of, of identity doesn't have to be placed on that role. Your whole being doesn't have to rest on whether you're a good mom or a bad mom or a good worker or a bad worker. No, I'm resting in my identity as a dearly loved child of God. And now I get to do everything else he's calling me to do from a place of rest, soul rest. That's good, guys, if I say so myself. That's good. We have identity, we have inheritance because Christ gave himself for us in our place to purchase that and give us this new life. That's good news. And you can find rest for all the work that seems hard. And you can turn this around so that we work hard for the glory of God and because he's loved us and purchased this for us. Guys, I'm embarrassed at how late I am right now. But I want to show you verse 23 where Moses says, uh, Jethro says to Moses, if you follow this advice and if God commands you to do so, then you will be able to endure the pressures and all these people will go home in peace. There's two things here. One, if you follow the advice... And two, if God commands you to do so, or if God so directs. When someone says, God's called me to do this, doesn't that feel a bit subjective? I can't argue with that. Someone says to me, hey, God's called me to set up a table for muffins out in the lobby every Sunday. Well, I mean, if God's called you, you know, what can I say, right? I mean, that's sort of a trump card. Uh, it's not always fair to use. Um, and I would say we should be really careful to use that trump card. Um, but when God directs you, I think you need a few things to help make calling a little more objective than as subjective as it feels sometimes. Can we show this slide for calling? Just want you to write these down and you can come to the women's cohort or the men's cohort, which the women's cohort starts in just a few weeks. If you didn't sign up and you think it's too late, just find us out in the lobby. There's some books for you. You can sign up today and grab those books. I want you to be a part of it, but we'll talk a little bit more about calling and identifying that. But I want you to see that when you identify calling, there's internal desire, and that's where a lot of us just stop. I just want to do it, so I think God's calling me to do it. Okay, how about we just go through this list together? Uh, external affirmation. Has anyone told you this was a good idea? I want to serve on the worship team, or I'd like to serve on the teaching team, or I'd like to serve on the connections team, or whatever. Has anyone told you you are a good singer? Has anyone invited you to their birthday party to sing for them? <laughs> how long have you been playing that instrument? Okay. Hey, I see the desire. <laughs> that's, a great, that's a great card you've played there. Let's play this one. How about any affirmation at all like Jethro gives to Moses? Then there's moral and character qualifications like, great, so you want to do this? And others have said they seem like they can see, see you doing this. Are there any character issues that you should sort out and work through that maybe we could do together as a church? Great. Next step, skill or ability. I want to do this so bad. Do you have the skill or ability, have or get? Do I have it? Can I get it? Need or opportunity? I really want to do this. Is there any real need for this? Or is there an open door of opportunity to step into? Sometimes that really helps to identify God's calling us. I feel called. We've had this desire. My friends have said we should all start a church. Boom. An opportunity opens up. And it's like, you know what? We're, this may be God calling us. That's, this is sort of a way to help us make it a bit objective. There's, there's opportunity or need that presents itself. And it becomes more clear. 
then I think there's seasons of life. It's not just that God isn't calling you. It just may be that you need to wait. It's just not the right time. And that's another way of, of indicating sort of God's calling. And then the last would be joy. And I say joy for uh, lack of a better way to put it. Sometimes when God's called you to do something, you feel stuck and you no longer have joy to do it. And that's probably an indication that he's not called you anymore. You should move on. And so I think that's a healthy thing to acknowledge. Some of us feel like the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. If God called me to do this, I'm stuck. I got to do this the rest of my life. And that's not true. But you do, need some, you do need some affirmation to walk through that to see if maybe you've just lost joy and need a transition. That's within the church, outside the church. But I think this is how we go about sort of following the advice. And this phrase here, if God commands you to do so or if God so directs you. We can get to the bottom of this calling and we can do this together. And the last thing I love is that these people, in this verse, verse 23, these people will go home in peace. Shalom. You can experience peace. I can experience peace. We can do this together by following God's call on our lives together. Let's pray. God, thank you for this time together. I feel like maybe because I haven't preached in a few weeks, <laughs> I just overstayed my welcome here. So, Lord, thank you for these people. More than anyone in this church building today, I thank you for the children's ministry workers, and I pray you would allow them to have grace on me. And I pray that today um, we would just be energized to discover what you're calling us to do, energized to do it together, and energized by your goodwill and the promise of your identity and inheritance that you share with us. How good this is and how good it would be. God. So I pray you would do Philippians 2.13. Would you work in us both to want to do and to do of your good pleasure. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.